everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Monroe and I am an ecologist, which means I study plants and animals and how they interact with their environment. Here on YouTube, I like to make videos all about ecology, but also what it's like to be a scientist in real life. So let me ask you a question. How do you think scientists come up with their best ideas? Well, if you watch a lot of movies, TV, or the news, you might think that we come up with our ideas sort of out of the blue, like a bolt of lightning and that we come up with all of our best ideas all by ourselves without any help from anybody else. This image of a scientist where ideas just seem to pop into our heads is known as the lone genius myth. And I promise you, even if you've never heard that phrase before, you've definitely seen it in action. So in this video, I am going to break this myth down. I'm gonna explain what it is and why, in my opinion, it is ruining science. So let's get straight to it. What is the lone genius myth? It is the idea that the most successful people in the world, including scientists, make all of their breakthroughs and discoveries on their own without the help of others. The lone genius is also someone who's typically considered naturally gifted. They are someone who was just born with better talents and abilities than the rest of us. As a result, their ideas, discoveries, and breakthroughs just seem to come to them more easily. This is probably the most common depiction of a scientist that you see in any type of media today. For example, Tony Stark, billionaire inventor and superhero, who spends most of his movies working alone. He also appears to be an expert in every topic imaginable. When did you become an expert in thermonuclear astrophysics? Last night. As for his creative process, he just seems to sort of mess around in his lab in montage and makes a discovery. Like, do you remember when he built a functional fusion reactor the size of a fist? In a cave! With a box of scraps! Or the time he solved time travel in one night after doing the dishes. Model rendered. That was easy. Or what about Doc Brown, whose entire support system seems to consist solely of one high school student? Doc? Don't say a word. Doc. Or how about Jeff Goldblum's character from Independence Day, who figures out the alien's master plan and how to destroy them all by himself? I gave it a cold. I gave it a virus. A computer. Virus. Apparently none of the government scientists were able to put that together. But this portrayal of a scientist isn't just how we depict our fictional characters, it's also how we tell stories about real life scientists. For example, in A Beautiful Mind, Nobel Prize winner John Nash is shown coming up with his groundbreaking ideas in game theory at a bar, trying to get a date. If we all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. But what if no one goes for the blonde? We don't get in each other's way. And we don't insult the other girls. That's the only way we win. Or in the imitation game where Alan Turing also at a bar, overhears a woman discussing what I have to assume are state secrets, but that's okay because it finally helps him crack the Enigma code. Why do you think your German counterpart has a girlfriend? It's just a stupid joke, don't worry. No, 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 no. T uh, tell me. Well, each of his messages begins with the same five letters, C-I-L-L-Y. So I suspect that silly must be the name of Fizzamore. Is it possible that Germans are instructed to use five random letters at the start of every message? Well, this bloke doesn't. Love will make a man do strange things, I suppose. In this case, love just lost Germany the whole bloody war. And in case you're wondering, this is not how these real life people came up with their breakthroughs. But you know what? Let's put Hollywood to one side for the moment. Instead, let's try and focus on what we believe the real life stories to be of some of our most famous scientists. Now, personally, when I think about geniuses that change the world, the first one that always comes to mind is, of course, as an ecologist, Charles Darwin. I know for a lot of people, the standout one is Albert Einstein. And if you've ever taken a biology class or studied medicine, you will have heard the story of Alexander Fleming. But regardless of who comes to mind for you when I say the word genius, when you picture them, are you picturing them working alone or with others? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that when you imagine them, you imagine them working by themselves without getting any help 
from anyone else. But nothing could be further from the truth. This image that we have of a lone genius isn't real 99% of the time. And the truth about these amazing people and their incredible work is so much richer, so much more wonderful than the lone genius myth ever could be. Let's start with Charles Darwin, who is often credited for discovering evolution. But this isn't quite right. Darwin was not the first person to try and argue that species evolve or change over time. Greek philosophers were speculating that humans might descend from other species as early as 500 BCE. And many scientists before Darwin were trying to work out how species evolve. It was actually French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck who published the first fully formed theory of evolution in 1809, nearly 50 years before Darwin published his theory. Darwin's revolutionary contribution was that he correctly determined the mechanism of evolution, known as natural selection. Darwin realized that organisms that are better adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and pass on their traits to their offspring. This process of passing on your best traits is what ultimately causes species to change or evolve over time. Now there is no doubt that Darwin's work was groundbreaking, but the point I'm trying to make is that his ideas were built on years of study by other scientists who were also trying to tackle the question of evolution. He also wasn't the only one to come up with this theory of natural selection. Another British naturalist named Alfred Wallace came up with virtually the exact same theory of natural selection as Darwin, and the two even published the first paper describing natural selection together in 1858. But after Darwin released his book on the origin of species one year later, Wallace sort of faded into obscurity. Albert Einstein also didn't come up with his ideas in a vacuum. He was active in the scientific community, learned from other people's ideas, and had brilliant friends who he liked to bounce ideas off of. For example, when trying to develop his theories of special and general relativity, Einstein got help clarity and inspiration from his old classmate and friend, an engineer named Michele Besso. According to Einstein himself, after a lot of discussions with his friend, he could suddenly comprehend the matter. Another influential collaborator for Einstein was mathematician Marcel Grossman. In 1912, the pair worked closely together on their research. Einstein reportedly told Marcel, you must help me or else I'll go crazy. The two eventually wrote a paper together in 1913, which was a precursor for Einstein's ultimate groundbreaking publication on his theory of general relativity. But my personal favorite has to be Alexander Fleming, world-famous microbiologist who discovered the life-saving antibiotic, penicillin. And as the story goes, it was a total accident. Fleming returned to his lab one day to find that bacteria cultures he was trying to grow had died because they'd been contaminated by mold. Fleming observed that the mold seemed to be producing some kind of substance that was killing the bacteria. This substance, which Fleming originally called mold juice, is what we know today as penicillin. And that's how antibiotics were born. One man, one lab, one botched experiment, and the next thing you know, antibiotics. Well, actually, the truth is a little bit more complicated. After Fleming published his findings in 1929, he wasn't able to convert his discovery into a therapeutic treatment. Although Fleming was a brilliant scientist, and he could see that penicillin could be used as medicine, he didn't have the background in chemistry that he needed to work out how to purify and isolate penicillin or create a method for mass production. It wasn't until 1939 when two other scientists, pathologist Howard Florey and biochemist Ernest Chain, read Fleming's paper and began the difficult process of working out how to isolate penicillin and produce it in large quantities. They were also the ones who worked out how to administer penicillin as a treatment. So yes, while Fleming made the first important discovery of penicillin, it was Chain and Flory that turned it into the life-saving treatment that we know today. In example after example, when we look at some of the most celebrated minds in our history, we begin to see the true nature of research. It isn't one person alone in a room having eureka moments. Their greatest accomplishments came from working with others and ideas building on each other over time. So who cares, I hear you say. So what if the lone genius myth isn't real? 
How does any of this ruin science? Well, the problem is, if we buy into the lone genius myth, we begin to believe that creativity and scientific ability are just natural talents. They are things that you're born with. So a lot of people might turn away from a career in science because they just think they haven't been born with the talent that they need. Even worse, it means whole groups of people, including women and people of color, are judged as not being naturally talented and are told not to participate in science. The lone genius myth also protects people who work in science from facing the consequences of inappropriate behavior. In a lot of film and television, brilliant people are depicted as just so smart and unique that they deserve special treatment. Being smart makes them better than everybody else and it puts them above the rules. Racist and sexist behavior get excused or written off as a joke because of their incredible genius. My father used to say that a woman is like an egg salad sandwich on a warm Texas day. <laughs> what? Full of eggs and only appealing for a short time. I need you to bring me the thong of Lisa Cuddy. Now, of course, not every scientist is like this, but this sort of thing does happen every day in the real world. And trust me, it's not funny. The lone genius myth also spreads the false idea that truly brilliant scientists never ask for help. This often makes scientists, particularly young scientists, feel too afraid to reach out and ask for help when they need it because they believe it will be seen as a sign of weakness. It also perpetuates the idea that everything you do in science should work out the first time. So people tend to quit when their experiments don't work out the way they'd hoped right away. We forget that science is a process of trying and failing and trying again. Science is trying. That's all that it is. You only get to really do something when you've been trying for so long that doing doesn't even seem possible anymore. Now I know that to many of you right now, I must seem like a bit of a villain. An unremarkable scientist on YouTube trashing all of your favorite heroes and historical figures. So I want to be clear, my dislike of the lone genius myth shouldn't be misinterpreted as a dislike of people's individual accomplishments. I'm also not saying that an individual's ideas or abilities aren't important. Scientists can definitely benefit from working alone and not all collaborations will be equal. But the lone genius myth takes things to an extreme and promotes harmful ideas about how science works and who a scientist can be. It reduces science down to one person having one brilliant moment which is almost never what really happens. So I would like to see us retire the lone genius myth from movies, TV, and real life. And I know a few of you will say that movies and TV have to use this myth to condense their stories down, but I strongly disagree. One of my favorite movies of all time is Apollo 13, and that movie does a great job of highlighting the heroes of the story while also showing the team effort that was involved in solving that crisis. The HBO miniseries Chernobyl is another great example of this. The show is centered around Valery Legazov. He is the lead scientist brought in to deal with the cleanup after the Chernobyl explosion and prevent further disaster. And there's no question that he is portrayed as a little bit of a lone genius in the show. But in real life, many other scientists were also involved. Legazov was an expert in inorganic chemistry, not reactors. So other specialists had to be brought in. Now I appreciate that showing dozens of scientists working on the Chernobyl crisis would make it hard to tell the other stories you want to tell. So instead, the writers created the fictional character, Dr. Olana Hamya. She was meant to represent all these other scientists, and she regularly challenges Legazov and points out when he makes mistakes. I know that your reactor core is exposed. I know the graphite's on fire, the fuel is melting, and you're dropping sand and boron on it, which you probably thought was smart, but you've made a mistake. So while the Chernobyl miniseries isn't perfect, I appreciate that it tries to show the collaborative and sometimes contentious nature of problem solving. So it is possible to tell stories about our greatest scientific heroes, while also being honest about what the scientific process is really like. And we should do it more! Because the truth is always so much more amazing than fiction. All right, everybody, that's it for me this time. Thanks so much for watching. Just so you know that I'm no lone genius, I always put all of my sources for everything I talk about in my videos 
in the description. So go ahead and check out those links if you'd like to learn more about where I get my facts from. If you enjoyed this video, please do like, share, and subscribe, and maybe check out another video that I did on a, another big problem in science, which is why we see so few women compared to men working in science today and what we can do to change that. And until next time, I'm gonna go grab a beer, head to my local bar, and try and come up with my next great scientific discovery. See ya.